Exterior, the Red Lion, Night. The orange glow of a cigarette illuminates the face of a young woman, Amy Cooper, 25. She leans on a bench. A security light flickers on and off at slow intervals. She wears a black polo shirt with a cartoon red lion. She stares into the dark, shivering slightly. A shadow moves, a spider making a web by the light. She smiles at the little creature. It moves away and she steps forward. Her smile fades. Around her are empty benches, empty ashtrays, save the one that she stands next to. She glances to one side, a disused doorway with a porch that reads, Ken's Garage. The porch is empty but for a dead bunch of flowers. She looks at the battered welcome sign above the front door. She rests her head in her hands. She looks up. She stares deep into the dark. George off screen. Amy, the ferret's off. She rolls her eyes in frustration. Amy. Coming! She takes one last drag and stubs her cigarette on the floor. She glances towards the hedge before turning and goes inside. In the hedge, a shadow moves. Interior, the Red Lion, Night. The pub is old and dusty, with empty chairs and tables all around. George, 81, and Ted, 79, sit at the bar, an empty glass in front of the latter. Amy comes back from the cellar. She gives them a meek smile and begins to pour the pint. She looks through the open curtains, trying to see the hedge. George. You all right, love? Yeah. Yes, sorry. Fine. Tired. Ted. Wait till you're our age. You won't know what tired is. She smiles politely. Ted lifts a mobile phone. Oh, your mum rang, by the way. I answered it. I hope that's all. Is she okay? Oh, she's fine. She'll call you later. She hands the pint to Ted and pockets her phone. The two men go back to their conversation and she lifts a duster from behind the bar. She runs it over the bottles on the back bar, clearly untouched for some time. Glancing up, she notices a web catching the light, a spider sitting perfectly in the middle. A smile creeps across her face. She puts down the duster and gently she extends a hand towards the web. Suddenly, the door is flung open, taking the party by surprise. Amy jumps, pulling her hand back. All turn to face the door. There stands a tall man wearing a long coat, his face concealed by shadows. Amy squints to see him. John, 32, enters the pub. He has dark hair and a small amount of stubble, which is interrupted by a small horizontal scar. The door closes itself, and he stares back at the three faces. He begins walking, slowly, towards the bar, inspecting the pumps. John. Evening. Horrible out there. Um, can I have a, a pint, of, pint of lager, please? You're not from round here, are you? John looks at them. I think you should order a real drink, or, or are, are you... Are you afraid to taste something? Not again, Ted. He'll have what he likes. I just say... Don't. She hands the stranger his pint. Sorry about that. Ted watches on, his face growing redder. George shakes his head. John moves to a table, throwing his coat casually over a chair and sitting. He pulls a pipe from his pocket. You can't smoke it. An orange glow emanates from the pipe and vapour from his mouth. He turns back to Ted. Amy leans over the bar and whispers to them. If you two insult every new customer, you'll have nowhere to drink. George sits up on his stool. It's about respect. When I was a boy, you'd never catch me dead saying George nothing continues like that. speaking to Ted about better? respect. Sure. John turns his head to the window. 
Amy notices the way the vapour is illuminated by the orange glow. Stifling a smile, she continues with her work. John observes Amy in the glass. Interior, the Red Lion, late night. George and Ted sit at a table by the fire, laughing loudly. Amy collects their empty glasses, a grin on her face. She glances at John's table, and it fades. She collects his glasses and their eyes meet. Quickly, she goes to the bar, ringing the bell. Last call! Oh, you ringing that for? Still early! It's one in the morning, Amy George. Says, Bollocks. My Doreen's gonna have my guts. You'd best get home, then. They stand unsteadily and down their pints. They hobble towards the door, placing the empties on the bar. Ted stops by John and points at him with a quivering finger. You best be on your way, proper short and behave your best. Don't you get no ideas about our aims, all right? John smiles and nods. He glances at Amy, and she looks away. The two men fall out the door. John looks out of the window to see them supporting one another, singing an old song. Amy looks up from behind the bar. That's you and all. Amy Cooper, yes? Yes. John smiles gently. Why? My name's John. I, uh, uh, I, I wondered if I might be able to buy you a drink. She tilts her head. He smiles. Interior, the Red Lion, late night. They sit at the bar, glasses surround them. They laugh as Amy tells a story. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> like a river down the stairs. And the next morning, Amy, that's a different Amy, steps in it and slips. <laughs> John chuckles. <laughs> she was furious. <laughs> when was that? Oh, I don't know. Uh, uni. Like, oh God, six years ago. Oh, is that right? She takes a big sip. Another? <laughs> yeah, why not? She moves behind the bar to pour another two. It's a long time. Well, I'm busy, so I can't always make it to... John observes her. My mum, see, and this place, it's... And mum, you know, is... Oh, it's not, like... Oh, it's not her fault. I mean, God, that would make me awful if I... She stops herself and smiles. <sighs> This got deep. Well, maybe a little bit. <laughs> no, no, go on. You come, you sit down. He stands, walking around to the other side of the bar and picks up the half-poured pint. Let's have it. Tell me. She smiles and moves to her stool. Quite the gent. She raises her glass in a mocking gesture. John smiles and starts pouring his own. Yeah, um, since her diagnosis, it's like I'm on hold. You know, I mentioned... She gestures around her. John sits and fixes her with an interested stare. Everything needs sorting. We need new everything, and I just can't... There's no money, no time. I have no time. She sips her drink. I have no friends because they've all moved away, along with everyone else in this bloody place. And now I'm ranting at a guy I've only just met. She takes another sip of her drink and groans. John smiles. You're doing the best you can. <laughs> I'm so bored of beams. It's just dust, you know. She looks up. The smile fades from her face. God, why am I telling you this? She looks around, suddenly aware. What are we doing? Don't, no, don't, don't worry about it. It's all okay. We're just, we're just having a drink. He smiles and touches her shoulder gently. She looks at his hand. No, this is not... This is... Amy. Uh, I don't know you, and I'm sorry for ranting, but we're not going to... You seem like a nice guy. No, that's no, not No, I mean, I... I really don't really go in for this kind of thing. No, Amy. actually, I'm sorry, but I think it's time for you to... I'm from the future. I... I... Don't even know what to do with that. Sorry, but you were spiralling. John pulls up his sleeve to reveal a device with flashing LEDs. 
Amy is unimpressed. Does that work? What? On girls. Has this ever actually worked? I mean, nice watch, yeah. Commitment to your thing. But it's a shite line. No, it's not. It's not a line. Yeah. She stands, picking up the glasses. John turns in his seat to face her. Your mum's going to call you in a minute. She's going to ask you to get her a pint of milk for tomorrow. Holy shit, this is cringe. She called you earlier, didn't she? And you never called her back. Listening at the door, were you? So she was worried then. Imagine how she'll feel at... Checks his watch. Three o'clock in the morning. Amy glances at her phone and shakes her head. It's none of your business. John stands. I'm right, though. I'm also right that your national insurance number is JW452729B. You were born in Ireland, Cork, on the 17th of April 1986. Your dad died when you were seven. Amy turns to face him. Raised by your mum, until your stepdad came on the scene and you moved to England. Until his death. Then you went to uni, and you did photography, but just after that your mum was diagnosed with MS. You care for her because... I felt like I could never move away after all she did for me. What are you reading? John shows her the small screen on his watch. Your autobiography, written in 30 years' time. Her eyes narrow and lips purse. You're a fucking stalker. John sighs. You can't be a stalker if your information's free to buy from Amazon. You're one of those, aren't you? That go through bins and stuff. I've I've not, I've never been through Time to go. She walks around the edge of the bar towards the door. John stands, grabbing her shoulders. No, 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 listen, because this is why I'm here. This is why I I, I sat and I drank with you and I, I listened to you. I've got something to tell you and I need you to be sure you could take it. She looks down at his hands. He follows her gaze and removes them. Amy calmly looks him in the eye. You're a weird, psycho stalker. Now, get out. She opens the door. No, wait, just listen. Tomorrow, tomorrow you're going to buy a scratch card. You're going to win and all your dreams are going to come true. Sounds nice. Get out. She gestures out of the door. It will change you. Money. It will change who you are. She takes a deep breath and looks out into the darkness. In the flickering light, she sees a gap in the hedge that wasn't there before. She glances at John's coat. There are twigs caught in the fabric. John looks at his watch and then to Amy. I'm sorry. She runs to it and answers. Hi, are you okay? A muffled voice on the other end. Amy looks around, eyes wide. The door shuts behind her. Yeah, I'm fine. Lots to do. Her eyes widen and she looks at John. Yeah, okay. She turns from John. Now get some sleep. You should, yeah, yeah. Pint of milk. John raises his eyebrows and sits on the bar stool. She looks at him. Okay, Mum. Night, night now. I don't believe you. Yeah, you do. You do believe me because there's always a moment. There's always a moment of proof. Something that I can't make up. How was I supposed to know your mum's going to call you at three in the morning to ask you for a pint of milk? She slumps back into an armchair. She sits in silence for a moment, looking around the space. How much? I'm not supposed to say. Right. You. Out you go. Trust me, trust me, it's enough. So, I should do what? Not buy it? You will regret it. She begins pacing again while John remains rooted to the spot. Okay. Warning received. I promise not to change. There you are. Good. It doesn't work like that. (laughs) She laughs at him. <laughs> That's not how people work. You know that. John sits back on a bar stool. This is cruel. You're taking advantage of me. Fine. I'll play. How do I change? How does money ever corrupt? You won't be you anymore. Her face falls. You. Giving. Selfless. Being that person is hard. Tonight proved that. Money like that. You won't have to struggle. Adversity breeds different things in different people. In you, it bred kindness, a love of the little things. Amy looks towards the web. John stands, 
and passes Amy her phone. A picture of her and her mum lights up. And losing that... That has a cost beyond yourself. She takes it and looks from the phone to John. How? John sighs. You don't resent your mother. Not really. But feelings like that, however small, can become amplified. Amy bows her head. John leans forward. You have a choice to make. Only you can make it. Two million starts something for you. It will grow your life into something you had no notion you could ever have for yourself. But now you know the cost. And the question. Is everything you never knew you wanted worth all you hold dear? Amy frowns. Tell me about tomorrow. Exterior, Amy's house, morning. Amy steps out, rushing and fumbling with a coat and scarf. John, voiceover. You will leave your house late tomorrow morning. You had a late night. As you walk, you'll be passed by three red cars. She walks down the path to get to her bus on time, noticing the cars. Exterior, bus stop, morning. She stops, counting the minutes on the clock. A frosty web hangs between two bars. John, voiceover. The bus is late. The driver's husband got a big promotion, so she stopped to congratulate him. The bus arrives. The bus driver grins at her. Driver. Lovely morning. Amy nods and she takes her seat, curling up against the cold. Interior. The bus travelling. Morning. Amy is looking out of the window. John, voiceover. A dog runs out into the road. His owner had a fall the previous night after getting drunk and attempting to do the dirty dancing lift in flip-flops. Amy scans the street, looking for dogs. She landed on her hand, so couldn't keep hold of old Bernie's lead. The bus stops abruptly. She looks around and sees a woman with a bandaged hand run to grab the dog's lead. She shouts apologies to the driver. Amy's eyes widen. Exterior, bus stop in town, morning. As Amy leaves, she sees the driver's phone on her lap. On it is a text with lots of smiling emojis. Amy smiles. She thanks the driver and leaves the bus, wincing slightly as she does. John, voiceover. You leave the bus in a rush. Let me tell you something now. Rush more. She steps off, watching for a few seconds before a bird poo falls exactly where she would have been seconds before. She looks at the pile of white and smiles. John. Voiceover. It's not good luck. Exterior. A street in town. Morning. She walks down the street, her eyes focused on the ground. John. Voiceover. You notice two one-pound coins in your path. Amy sees them and bends down. She lifts them up and looks across the road to the newsagents. Interior, the Red Lion, the previous night. Amy looks at John, waiting for more. He stares straight ahead. Then? That's up to you. Amy stands, taking a few steps from John, gazing at the dilapidated old pub. He stands and moves several feet away. She turns to meet his eye. Exterior. The newsagents. Morning. Amy exits the shop holding a bag. She looks across the road and sees John standing there. She looks down, frowning. John's eyes narrow. She 
She reaches into the bag, she rummages around and finally removes a pint of milk. She waves to John, smiling widely. A tear in her eye, she walks around the corner and down the street. Interior, Amy's mother's room, afternoon. Mum, 64, is sitting up in bed, gazing out of the window. The sun illuminates the room. A door slams. <laughs> Mum? Mum. Darling? Amy bursts in and throws her arms around her, smiling wide and holding her tight. I got the milk, Mum. Tears stream down her face as she holds her mum ever closer. Fade to black. John stands as Amy waves goodbye to him. He smiles back to her. She rounds the corner. As she does, his smile vanishes abruptly. His eyes narrow and he takes a deep breath. He pulls two one-pound coins from his pocket. Quickly, he crosses the road. The end. Two Pounds was written by Marcus Armstrong and was read by Belinda Lees with Ruth Hayes as Amy and Marcus Armstrong as John. This is a different kind of episode for us, so let us know if you enjoyed it and would like to hear some more. We have plenty more to come this year in Season 2, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out. From all of us at the Script Department, we wish you a very happy 2021. And as always, thanks for listening.